Have you ever felt the urge to touch a lens like a button or a joystick? Okay, probably not because you're well behaved, but maybe you will soon. This is a rather long video about the lens leech, a soft silicone cylinder that can be used to process user input directly on and above camera lenses. I'm gonna talk a bit about why something like this might make sense, about how to manufacture soft silicone touch sensors and close focus lenses, about deformation marker patterns and a bit of computer vision. If you make it to the end, hopefully, you'll see some examples of how this can be used on cameras and smartphones. But let's start at the start. Cameras are pretty crazy little machines. This sensor here costs about a dollar and has more than 5 million tiny light detectors, plus readout circuits and basic signal processing. That's a lot, but still, if you want to use it in a camera to take photos, you need to add half a dozen buttons and a screen. Each of these buttons has a mechanical spring, a contact, a cable, and you will need to read the voltage, filter the signal, trigger a software interrupt, and so on. This stuff is absurdly large and clunky compared to semiconductor structures on the sensor itself. A while ago I asked myself a question. How would a camera need to work that has no physical buttons, no dials, no knobs, no touchscreens? And how good or bad would that actually be? That basically meant I had to find out how I could get user input into the camera. When dealing with computers or other digital devices, no matter if large or small, there are few interaction techniques that go beyond the usual concepts like windows, icons, menus and pointers. Some of these techniques are based on input from cameras. But all of these interaction techniques happen at a few distinct spatial distances. Augmented reality overlays can add anything from street names to images on pages of a book. When cameras are tracking your position for VR games, the distance may be a meter or two between you and the tracking hardware. When you are scanning a QR code, you are holding your phone somewhere at a distance of 20 centimeters to a meter or so. But you never do something directly on your camera. And there's a reason for that. Minimal focal distance. But it would be pretty nice if we could have some way of getting input directly on or above a camera lens. Okay, chances are high that I'm not the first person who wants to use lenses as input elements. Let's look at some academic papers from the field of human-computer interaction. And by some I mean two, because there are only two, at least to the best of my knowledge. First, there's Lens Gesture by Xiang Xiao et al. The idea is that your finger is sliding over a smartphone camera and by feeding the image data into a neural network you can detect a few simple gestures. The other paper is ChemTrack Point by Wataru Yamada et al. They are using a 3D printed smartphone case that has a black ring on springs. By placing the finger on the ring and moving it, some light is still going through the tissue of the finger while you can see the occlusion of the ring on the camera. That's a bit more reliable and easier when it comes to image processing. Both of these concepts make use of blurry image data and your naked finger. That has a certain advantage because you don't need any additional stuff except a modified smartphone case for one of the papers. But let's see if we can improve on that. Basically, we need to know more about the finger so we can have more types of input. Maybe the exact position, maybe the pressure the finger is putting on an object or the lens, maybe some additional stuff. But we can't get that from thin air. The finger needs to interact with something and it's better not the lens. Both papers did work with smartphones because smartphone lenses are covered by hardened sapphire or tempered glass. But not all cameras are similarly sturdy. Let's skip a few mental steps and a lot of failed experiments here and allow me to introduce the blob. The blob is, well, it's a blob. It's a cylinder with a curved top entirely made from soft silicone. It doesn't scratch the glass surface it sits on and it's considerably less greasy than the average human fingertip. In addition to its remarkable property of being soft and squishy, it's also clear. It's pretty hard to visually directly track a fingertip just a few millimeters above a lens. Fingertips have few distinct high contrast features. They are single color, not a lot except flashy. But if they deform something that's easier to track than the fingertip itself, our job is a lot easier. That's the reason why there's a point pattern on the surface. On top of that, we somehow need to solve our close focus problem. 
coincidentally, the clear silicone is doing an okayish job at refracting light. So we don't just look through the blob like through a window, but we use a curved surface to collimate light like a lens. Then we just need to focus the camera at infinity and the pattern on top of the blob is always in focus, even when it sits directly on the glass of the lens. Since I need some name for this project, I'm calling these blobs lens leeches. So let's talk about all the steps to make a lens leech, then see how the image processing works and finally show some examples of how you can or could use it in the real world. For explanation purposes, I impose some kind of order artificially, but in reality I was going back and forth, fixing problems and improving the concept. So expect some gaps in causality. Let's start with the most daunting part. How can we make a silicone lens? To create precise silicone objects, molding is the most reasonable technique. For that a negative mold is required and it needs an extremely smooth optical surface to create a lens as a part of the silicone object. I made a separate video about how that can be done with rather basic tools. Short version? The parts of the mold need to be milled from acrylic, ground to make them perfectly spherical and polished so the surface is smooth enough to be optically useful. Then the parts of the mold can be clamped together before finally being filled with liquid clear silicone. Once the silicone is cured, we can open the mold and get a squishy lens. Once we got a silicone body, we need a way to optically measure deformation. We can do that by tracking a high contrast pattern with the camera, but we need to put that on the surface somehow. Silicone has a very desirable property, which sadly is a problem in this particular case. Almost nothing bonds to silicone except silicone itself. Painting silicone with alcohol or acrylic based paints is not durable, the paint simply rubs off after drying. There are basically only two options. Either mix pigments into silicone before it cures, or mix uncured silicone with pigments and use it as a painting material on already cured silicone parts. There are two products for this. The simple option is platinum cure silicone, which cures by chemical reaction after a few hours. The alternative is a specialized silicone ink. These do not cure by simply mixing base component and catalyst, but need to be baked at high temperature. Those are mostly used for screen printing silicone logos on polyester sports jerseys or putting text on silicone wristbands. But how do we deposit the silicone and pigment mixture on the surface? Screen printing does not work well with a curved surface like the lens leech top. Usually you would use pad printing for large numbers of objects with curved surfaces. But setting up a reliable pad printing process is a lot of work for just a few prototypes. An alternative could be to directly deposit the silicone pigment mixture with a syringe and that's what I tried first. I modified a macro rail for moving a camera to press a syringe plunger and mounted it in my CNC machine. Using a very small syringe and a tiny needle allowed me to deposit silicone droplets at exactly the right height and position. But in general, it's pretty hard to control pressure in the syringe precisely enough to get consistent tiny droplets with the highly viscous silicone mixture. So I gave stencils another try. What worked well in the end are not flat stencils like screen printing or deformable stamps for pad printing, but rigid three-dimensional stencils. When milling a stencil from acrylics that has the exact curvature of the silicone body, we can press the silicone against the stencil and get a good seal. The channels are drilled with micro drills for PCB production. The silicone paint can be poured over the channels and after degassing plus a few minutes of rest time, the stencil can be removed. Let it fully cure overnight and repeat for the next color. As a silicone paint, I used smooth on Psycho Paint. It bonds well to the already cured clear silicone and was more reliable than reusing the clear silicone of the main body. Adding the color to the paint is slightly more complicated. Most silicon pigment colors are sold as liquid emulsion. The solid pigments are mixed with silicon oil as a fluid. This makes it easier to handle, measure and mix the color. The downside? When you add too much silicon oil to your liquid silicone, it may prevent it from curing. Most vendors recommend 3 or 5% as an upper limit. But we want to deposit tiny amounts of silicone and it should be a strong and saturated color. 
I did test smooth on silicone pigments at 5% and was not happy with the results. Buying the pigments as solid particles and mixing them directly with the translucent silicone did work considerably better. About 10% of pigment powder did yield sufficiently saturated thin blobs of silicone. The exact measurements and the procedure I used are described in the Git repository. So, we got a reliable way of adding a colored pattern to the silicone body. Let's look at common computer vision markers next. Since we are using a stencil, we can't create complex shapes without sacrificing a lot of precision. So we'll stick to points and can't use any of the classic marker patterns. With a simple single color point pattern in a grid, we can measure deformation of the silicone. But maybe we want more. It would be perfect if we could sense position, rotation and deformation of the silicone blob. But every additional color requires a lot of manual work. Given just two or three colors, we need to make a marker pattern that allows us to match or recognize a sufficient number of points to get at least the rotation. How do we do this? For that, let's grab something from the bucket of slightly odd human computer interaction products. About a decade ago, the company Inoto released a ballpoint pen with a built in camera and a special type of paper. The paper had a very faint point pattern printed on it that allowed the pen to see its position on the paper when writing. The point pattern patented by Inoto did encode four different numbers as deviations from the center. These numbers were arranged in unique patterns usually known as a two-dimensional De Bruyne sequence. In the simplest case, we got a pattern of only two numbers. Each window of a specified size can only be found once, in this case, a 3 by 3. If we move in any direction, that's a new unique window. Inoto was able to use four different numbers and encode them as offsets from a precise position because paper is flat and rigid. For our soft and deformable surface, we'll need to use color. Another issue is geometry. With a rectangular grid, we're wasting a lot of space and sadly we don't have a lot. With a standard phone camera, we see about a centimeter in diameter of the blob surface. And the larger the points, the more reliable our image processing will be. So we will be doing something that's a lot of work for a marginal improvement. We'll create our own, slightly more space efficient pattern. The optimal way to fill a plane with circles is not rectangular, but hexagonal packing. The only problem is that on a grid you can move in two directions and your blocks are always rectangular. On a hexagonal plane you can move in three directions and your blocks are hexagons. For a grid it's pretty easy to find really large two-dimensional De Bruyne sequences computed by other people. For hexagons you can't. So one option would be to take the De Bruyne math and combinatorial tools and adapt them to another movement axis. Or we just brute force a pattern. The blob we use is rather small anyway, so we may be getting away with just making up a few million solutions and testing them instead of actually computing them in an elegant way. And indeed, it took a few days, but we got a solid selection of patterns. The brute forcing script tries to build a valid pattern with no duplicates from a random seed and then judges it. When you rotate a hexagon and find it somewhere else in the pattern, the score is reduced. In the end, we don't get an optimal pattern with just two colors, but it should be good enough. If we add a third color, we find a duplication-free pattern in a trivial amount of time, but using only two colors is such a benefit for detection stability that we'll just keep it that way. So we got a silicone body with a working pattern. Now we just need to take care of image processing and the first step is to find the points and group them. You've seen it before, the points are color-coded with blue and green. That gives the best contrast to fingertips among the range of human skin tones. But the tricky part is not only finding the points, but differentiating between them in a wide range of ambient illumination situations. By using a diffuse top surface for the blob, we can make that problem a bit easier. The ambient light is out of focus anyway. But now even a fingertip a few millimeters above the surface is nicely blurred. Detecting the points in the pattern is slightly more complicated. If we look at our input data as pixels in a three-dimensional color space, we can see that we got two nicely separated groups, so that should be easy to differentiate. 
I'm not using red, green and blue here, but the HSV color model with hue, saturation and a brightness value, which makes a lot more sense in this case. Same colors, other mathematical representation. The problem is, once the light in the room changes or the finger touches the surface, the auto white balance algorithm takes a few moments before adapting. We can't expect good results with fixed thresholds for segmentation in this case. So we grab something from the very basic computer science toolbox and use a clustering algorithm. But if we look closely, probably we don't need to care about saturation and value. Only hue makes really a difference. So we've got a one-dimensional clustering problem, which looks a lot like a histogram. And since we got only two groups, that means adaptive thresholding. So we do a bit of fixed thresholding to get the points, extract U values for these points, apply Otsu's method to find a threshold, and we got two solid sets of points. Using Otsu's method instead of a k-means with randomly initialized starting points takes about one-fifth of the computation time, so it's an acceptable trade-off. Quick side note, interestingly, there's by now an improved approach to Otsu's 45 years old method with a generalization and tunable parameters. In general, segmentation and classification of the point pattern is, well, there's room for improvement, both in terms of speed and accuracy. But it's good enough to work as a demo, and it's... Once we got all the colored points, each one is grouped with its closest six neighbors. Since we don't know the correct rotation, we try to find matches for all six possible hexagons in our pattern. For each hexagon, we check a lookup table and try to find a position in our pattern that matches up with the highest number of other hexagons. That's the most inefficient step of the detection pipeline, and if a pattern would contain each hexagon only once, no matter the orientation, this would not be necessary at all. But for that we need three colors, and that's more costly in fabrication and less reliable when segmenting points and background. Once we have our point matches, we can compute input gestures. Rotation is found with a 2D version of Kapsch's algorithm. Translation can be detected with the centroid of all detected points. The deformation when squeezing the sides is detected using the average circularity value for all hexagons and deformation by pressing on the top can be seen when thresholding local maxima and point distances. With this data, we got four different gestures we can use for input. What can we actually do with this now? I built three application examples. The first two are only concepts, but the hybrid viewfinder is a fully functional device. Let's talk about action cameras first. Imagine you got a tiny device with a camera. Not a lot of space for buttons, not a lot of space for a usable touch screen, because it's mainly a camera. Usually you set the settings with a smartphone app, but sometimes that may not be an option, when skiing or diving, for example. You can combine the lens leech with a hard plastic ring that slides over the lens, so the lens leech becomes a rotation knob plus button. A similar concept works for larger cameras as well. Unlike a smartphone, interchangeable lens cameras are single-purpose devices. You capture photos or videos and that's it. But often one might change menu settings or browse pictures with an attached lens cap. By integrating the silicone body into the lens cap, we can add additional input elements in front of the camera. But optical attachments in general can not only provide input but output as well. Imagine you got a smartphone and you want to take photos. Maybe it would be nice to have all the advantages of classical viewfinder cameras while making use of the high quality camera you are carrying around in your pocket anyway. We can combine a classic optical viewfinder design with some prisms and beam splitters and create a hybrid viewfinder. The viewfinder attachment can be slid over the phone. A prism redirects a section of the smartphone display into the viewfinder as an overlay. The lens leech sits on the front camera, so by rotating the lens leech, it's easy to select an overlay type, for example, compositing frame lines or a digital horizon. By pressing the silicone, you can take a photo. And all of this can be done without the touchscreen, so you can use your phone like a classic camera. In case you're wondering how that works on the optical level, I made a whole video about the hybrid viewfinder. 
Last chapter. The lens leech does check a few important boxes for on lens interfaces. It's safe to use on lenses. It requires no modification to existing devices. It's completely passive and mostly universally compatible. But nothing works perfectly all the time in all situations. And the last two points cause a bit of problems or come with a few limitations. The fact that it's completely passive means it requires ambient illumination. One problem with that is tinted light. The brain is pretty good at discerning color casts and recognizes a white object as white, even if it reflects blue or yellow light. Cameras use an auto-white balance algorithm for this and most of them perform worse with a lens leech on the lens. Another issue is that there needs to be a minimum amount of light to work at all. I did some measurements and if you've got more than 150 looks it works okay with most cameras. That's a recommended indoor lighting for office spaces. In some situations we can improve reliability by a lot with some ultraviolet illumination because the colors are UV reactive pigments. But there's another problem and that's pupil size. Every lens has an entrance pupil. Simple explanation, that's the image of the narrowest point of the lens, usually that's the aperture, is seen through the front of the lens. For photographing objects at infinity, the entrance pupil doesn't matter. But for very close objects, that does make a difference. If the diameter of the pupil is considerably larger than the diameter of the silicone lens of the lens leech, the camera won't see enough points of the pattern. I've got three lenses here. All of them have the same field of view of 84 degrees, or about 24 millimeters on a full frame camera. But only two of them are lens leech compatible. Smartphones and action cameras work perfectly. For other cameras, it really depends on the size of the lens. What are the things which make sense going forward? Right now, there is only a single kind of lens leech, which can be used as a knob or a joystick. One option would be to sense fingerprints as well. A clear silicone surface acts very similar to an optical fingerprint sensor if the illumination angle is correct. For some situations, screens or devices or LEDs would be able to provide the necessary light to make it work. Then you could retrofit fingerprint sensor to a smartphone or a camera lens cap. Maybe not so much for authentication, but for triggering different actions with different fingers, for example. Another option would be a touchscreen lens cap. For that we need to detect push locations precisely within a wide field of view. But all of that are ideas for the future. So let's do a quick conclusion. Does all of this make sense? Mm, depends, I would say. First and foremost, it's an idea, a concept. It's not a product that you can buy or that anyone should buy but it proves that there's a technical way of retrofitting a multitude of existing camera-based devices with slightly more expressive input methods. On top of that, there's a whole world of soft robotics research. Robot arms and robot bodies made of soft silicone. User interaction is often measured only with electrical resistance sensors, but direct vision-based interaction with soft silicone blobs embedded in a soft robot's body may be an interesting option. The next step would be to ask people if they would actually trust the squishy silicone blob not to scratch their lenses. There is kind of a culturally ingrained respect for shiny lens surfaces and people are extremely careful around those. But that's some future work. If you're wondering, wow, that sounds so detached from reality, that's probably an academic paper. Yeah, you're right. If you prefer to read the actual paper, which is slightly less silly, and a lot more to the point, links in the description. But I mean, you already watched this video, so anyway. If you think that's a great idea, or if you think that's the worst stuff you've ever heard about and want 24 minutes of your life back, let your feelings run free in the comments. If you think I missed something or got yourself an idea on how to improve this silly concept, I would appreciate it even more if you let me know about that. Software, hardware, 3D models and slightly more detailed explanations are available and open source in a repository. Link is in the description. Everything else is on the website. That's it. Video is over. I hope you enjoyed this wild ride of odd stuff and got some ideas for yourself.